I'm going to go ahead and open Photoshop. I'm going to create, um, first I'm just going to create a, a document, 1500 by 500. So it's going to be a rectangle that's somewhat long here. Then I'm going to dig into my Photoshop here and look at my acrylic brushes. I've got an acrylic brush set, brush <coughs> brush set excuse me, that I got from Kyle Webster. I'm on an older version of Photoshop, but on the new Photoshop, you should have all of his brushes. If I come in here and hit B, um, then I'm going to use left bracket to bring this brush size down. And what I need to do is actually rotate my canvas so that this is going to feel straight in the comp. And I have to do this just to try to um, adjust for the fact that the acrylic brush itself is on a tilt. So if I kind of uh, rotate my canvas in this way, so let's just do black, right? Let's see how that looks. And you see, I've got a little bit of detail, but for the most part, it's uh, just entirely filled in black on the top and then getting a little, a little detail on the bottom. So before I move on, um, and I actually need to make sure I make my, my mark here on, uh, on a fresh layer. I'm gonna go ahead and delete this background layer because I actually do want this on an alpha channel. And that's actually gonna give me a little more information that's going on here. Now, one thing I wanna do is actually add a layer mask on this guy and see if I can, uh, I'm gonna hit F, see if I can um, actually make this side a little more textured like that. So let me increase the size on this. So I'm gonna use a layer mask to delete a little bit. Let me go a little bit smaller. And I'm actually gonna decrease the flow just a little bit because I don't wanna Actually, I better go flow all the way to 100. And I'm gonna go back into my brush presets and see if I can find a different edge for that guy. Mm, don't love that one. What about something like that? Mm, don't love it. Let's try, let's try to beat up this edge a little more. See, that's looking a little better. That's a little too much. at that edge a little bit. Okay, so that's the first thing I'm going to do is create this first texture. I'm going to hit go ahead and hit command S to save this and I'll just save to my desktop here for the sake of a demo. And I'll say paint 02. And then let's go ahead and jump into Cinema 4D and talk about using this element, right? So the first thing I'm going to do is actually grab a polygon in my scene here, and I want to match the proportions of my Photoshop document, right? So I'm going to go 15 by 500 so that I don't uh, warp the X or Y scale of my texture. And what I'm going to do is actually come into the alpha channel, turn it on, and then click the three dots so I can go ahead and load up a file with the alpha channel information saying, do you want to create a copy? Sure, that's fine. So then if I go and apply this texture, you'll see kind of where we're headed with this, right? Where um, now I've got the, the paint swatch in, it's at a good resolution, um, it renders, you see a little bit of the detail going on there. Um, now the next thing we could do is come into color, right? Because I've only loaded the PSD file into the alpha channel, I still have the ability to go ahead and change these colors pretty dramatically, right? I could uh, do this. We could actually do it on a gradient from one side to the other. What if we go top to bottom? Can I do an angle on this gradient? Let's do a 90 degree angle on a gradient and do something like red to maybe a pink kind of color, right? So that's, uh, so that's one advantage we're gonna get right away, right? Is the ability to go ahead and color this thing however we want it, right? We just are using the alpha channel information. Now the next thing I'm gonna do is add some subdivisions 
to this element, right? Because if just by default, if it's on one segment, I can't really twist this or morph it or bend it like I see um, in the example how we're getting these bends. But if I go ahead and start adding some segments here, I'm going to have a lot more flexibility to play with this thing. So just to quickly give you a sense of where we're headed with this, let's go ahead and bring a spline in. I'm just gonna grab a helix spline. I'm gonna blow this guy up to a somewhat decent size. Then I'm gonna come into the settings here and I'm gonna bring this height way up because I really want to do kind of a spiraling, twisting, turning animation that I can work with here. I'm gonna bring that height up even more and the end angle uh, and radius, I might actually blow up a little bit because I can imagine my camera kind of flying through this or maybe the paint starts close on one end and then as the camera flies forward, it starts to pull out even wider. So the first thing we're gonna do now that we have this set up is come into um, our deformers here and use this tool called a spline wrap. And a spline wrap is uh, really useful. And let's see, let me try to remember correctly here. First thing we need to do with the spline wrap is actually assign it a spline, right? So the helix. So you're gonna see that because the spline is the child of the polygon, it's already affecting it. And what it's deciding to do is take it the entire <laughs> length of, uh, of the spline here. And that's just based on toggling this mode to either fit spline or keep length, right? I just want the element to keep its length um, so that I can get in here. Let me just zoom out slightly so you can see what we're doing. Let's go ahead and get out here and then play with this offset, right? That's gonna allow it to kind of fly through the air. And because I've got, you know, because I have enough segments on this polygon, I can bend it to this spline and the, the spline itself, the angle's at five. I'm actually gonna take it to zero. I just want a perfect spline. I don't want it to, to have a 5% angle. And you can see that uh, it's gonna bend really nicely, right? It's not gonna be an issue in terms of, in terms of it breaking down as we pull it along this spline. So that's the first thing we can do. Now, inside of a spline wrap, it's got this, um, let's go ahead and take a look here, spline. It's got a feature called a rail, and a rail is a second spline. So I'm actually gonna duplicate my helix, and I'm gonna call this one a rail. And I'll go back to my spline wrap, and I'm gonna feed it the rail layer. Now, it looks all messed up. Now, as I actually pull this up, you're gonna see what a rail, what the function of a rail is here, right? A rail is basically a secondary spline that tells the face of the spline where it should look. So hopefully you can see, as I move this rail, the face of the spline is following it, right? So if it's forward, then I see it forward. If it's back, it's back. If it's right over top, then it sits totally flat. So you can see exactly what that's giving us. Now this is useful um, because like in, like in the World Cup piece, sometimes you need the faces uh, of, the, of the actual paint to be sitting in a certain area. So a rail is a good way to tell the face um, exactly where you'd like it to be, right? And try to dial that in ever so slightly. So that is the function of a rail.